สวัสดีค่ะ Good afternoon, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, former ambassador to Australia, President of Southeast Asian University, and all distinguished guests. Southeast Asian University, in collaboration with the International Peace Foundation and the Education Society of Thailand, are honored to host the event series, The Bridges. Dialogues towards a culture of peace, primarily to establish creative conflict resolution programs for the growing threats of war and international terrorism. In this very particular event, it is a special privilege to have the keynote speaker from Liechtenstein to deliver his speech on conflict resolution in the modern world. At this moment, I would like to call upon the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation for the opening address. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Uwe Molovis. As a contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly in the year 2000, Thailand has now been chosen as the host country for the event series Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, and initiated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political independent foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. Thailand has been chosen for the following reasons. The Thai nation and its people, with their self-confidence, open-mindedness, and tolerance, could provide a creative pathway towards peace. Under the wisdom and spiritual leadership of His Majesty the King, as the shining example for inner and outer peace, the democratic Thailand has the ability to promote peace and the potential to stabilize the region. It has a rich, diversified network of national and international organizations, including business, diplomatic corps, media, and NGOs, which provide the ground for an enhanced intercultural dialogue. Bridges, dialogues towards a culture of peace, Will we will continue today with the keynote speech of His Serene Highness, Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein, who will address the topic conflict resolution in the modern world. 
the series of 250 lectures and dialogues, seminars, workshops, and artistic performances, which started in November 2003, will then be further continued in Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, Chonburi, Kanchanaburi, Konken, and Nakhon Rajasthima until April 2005. During a one-year period of time, 27 Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and economics, as well as decision makers in international politics, economy, science, culture, and the media, are joining hands with Thai leaders in all parts of society to promote the kingdom as a center for dialogue and international understanding. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of the events program reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and our environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. <coughs> และรวมมือกันให้ครองการสร้างสรรค์ปัญสูสันติวัฒนธรรมได้เกิดขึ้นจริงๆซึ่งครองการนี้ได้รับแรงบันดาลใจจากการได้เห็นพระบัตรสม
um, it is a great opportunity for our university and for the students to, to get the chance to listen to the speech by the, the His Serene Highness, who not only have worked uh, in connection with peace, but also have education and background in political science. He has worked, as Mr. Morwick has said, uh, for the sake of peace for quite some time. Peace is the most important thing for human beings. And when the Peace Foundation offered me to select many topics, for example, on economics, on in medical science, I choose the topic that concerning peace because I think peace is the most important for the survival of mankind. And today, I think we're going to get knowledge, learn many things from the speech of His Serene Highness, Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. May I now call upon the former ambassador to Austria to contribute a special note on the cultural background of Austria and Liechtenstein. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Somkiel Arya Prachia. Your Serene Highness, Prince Albert and Fred, Chairman of the Advisory Board of the International Peace Foundation. Your Serene Highness, Rafaela of Wittgenstein. Dr. Norum Simsovat, Director of the Southeast Asia University. Mr. Yue Bonavich, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the International Peace Foundation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I'd like to say how pleased I am to be here, uh, and I would like to join uh, you know, my former speakers, uh, in particular my good friend and director, Dr. Narone, to welcome Your Serene Highness and you know, uh, Your Serene Highness to the British, to Thailand. I hope you have a good stay here, and uh, of course uh, on Sunday we have uh, an election. This is a great experiment in democracy. This is one of the way that we call conflict resolutions as well. So uh, I hope you have the chance to witness important moment in our history. Dr. Narong had asked me to uh, say a few words about Liechtenstein, a country in Europe which I had visited not too long ago. Why? Because uh, I have been ambassador to many countries in Europe. Poland, to the EU, uh, to Brussels, Luxembourg, uh, and also recently Austria, and had been to your country. So not so many people uh, hear about Richard Stein. So uh, to put your speech in perspective, he asked me to say a few words. But I will not take a long time because I know all of us here are eagerly awaiting to hear your serene highness talking about conflict resolution. So I will be very brief. I can take only a few minutes, and I will say only three points. First point, Richard Stein is a constitutional monarchy based on parliamentary democracy. Richard Stein is a very interesting country as it is a country which, like other countries in Europe, knows the scourges of war very well. As you know, in the past, Europe had been fearless for many disastrous conflicts and wars. 
World War I, World War II, and not long, before, not long ago, the Balkan Wars, just to say a few. And their catastrophe were enormous in terms of human sufferings and material damages. The European community, which is now known as the European Union, was born out of the desire of Europeans not to allow war to occur again in Europe. The Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, or OSCE, which is based in Vienna, is also another effort of Europeans to solve possible conflicts by preventing diplomacy and outreach activities to coordinate among cultures to, uh, in a way, uh, not to have uh, what we call the clutches of civilizations. For your information, Thailand is a partner for cooperation with OSCE, where we regularly hold exchanges of view and experience on confident building measures. As ambassador of Thailand in, in Austria, I used to attend the many uh, OSCE meetings and exchange view with them on how to solve conflicts around the world and also how to uh, have outreach activity to talk about cultures, elections, what are the best practices, that sort of thing. So this is uh, a lot of experience you know, from Europe. As Europe is uh, one of the major players, both economically and politically, its views, opinion, and experiences regarding the appropriate policy and ways to resolve conflict is very important to world peace. Therefore, his Syrianness speech today should be most useful for Asia, as Asia has also a few flat points that could turn into major conflicts if they are not handled well. Second point, something about Liechtenstein for you. Liechtenstein, though small in size and in population, only about 160 square kilometers, with just about 35,000 people. It's a very developed country. It has very high per capita income, about 25,000 US dollars. Thanks to its strategic locations near Austria, hence the European Union, a very big market you know, uh, of so many millions, four or five hundred millions on the east, and Switzerland on the west, and also its industrious people. Its integration with Switzerland in the Customs and Monetary Union, and also its low taxes, quite low. Liechtenstein has, through the years, developed into a peaceful, prosperous, free market economy with a very vibrant financial sector. Third point. Liechtenstein is a very beautiful country with Austria on the east and Switzerland on the west. It's postcard like I see, but I have been there. Mountainous landscape is very similar to that of Switzerland and Austria. Facilities for tourists are superb. Therefore, one should not miss the opportunity to visit Liechtenstein, in particular, Vaduz, its capital. In case you don't have much time or time constraint, you may get a glimpse of Richard's Drive to a visit to the recently opened Palace of Richard's Drive Museum in Vienna, which I went there at the inauguration ceremony. Beautiful paintings of art by masters. So uh, I think all of you uh, would concur with me that we are very happy to, uh, to, uh, to have a uh, you are sitting in highness with us to give us the speech, which is very timely and very important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sankir, for your contribution. And so, we are all convinced that Liechtenstein is a very nice place to visit. Now, we are proud of introducing our distinguished keynote speaker today. 
He is the chairman of the advisory board of the International Peace Foundation in Vienna. He received his master's degree in computer science and economics at the University of Vienna, where he also studied political science, systems theory, cybernetics, biology, philosophy, and artificial intelligence. Since 1976, he has been chairman, CEO, and board member in several companies in the fields of engineering, investment, trading, banking, and consulting. He is also actively involved in various nonprofit organizations, among others, as the president and co-founder of the Vienna Academy for the Study of the Future, chairman of the Society of Fathers of the International Peace Foundation, board member of Search for Common Ground, member of the Honorary Board of UN Global Youth Forum, member of the International Academy of Science, and fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. He published two books, Medicine by Evolution, and Internet, the Public, and Democracy. And he also received the International Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award in 1990 in New York. More importantly, he is married to a very beautiful lady, Her Serene Highness Princess Lafayette of Liechtenstein. And she is here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to His Serene Highness Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon uh, uh, to Your Excellency and to the Rector and all the uh, staff members and professors of the University. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to this afternoon together with you. My topic for today is conflict resolution in the modern world. So what I we do and what I have discussed uh, with your uh, rector is that I will just give you a brief outline of what I could speak and about what we could discuss so that we uh, have uh, much time for answers and questions because conflict resolution is all about dialogue. So I'm most interested to enter into a dialogue and to use this format then to go deeper into uh, certain issues uh, which are raised by you. If I speak about conflict resolution in the modern world, I follow um, the structure of His Excellency the Ambassador. I speak also about three parts. Good format. <laughs> So the first part uh, would be that we speak about the modern world. What is the main what are the main features of our modern world? First, I think it's the rise of the concept of the individual. You know in uh, in the middle ages before the age of enlightenment in Europe uh, we also had a traditional society comparable to many other cultures around the world. But then something happened in history, and this is that the concept of the individual suddenly came up and appeared in history, and this was in Europe. From then on, traditional societies have been transformed tremendously and still on a global scale we see that this is going on today. What do I mean with this? That 
in pre-individual societies, the collective was the main interest and the main focus of the society. And now everything is changing. And young people around the world are very much attracted by this new way of life, by the American way of life, by the Western values, because through mass media, through pop culture, uh, and through what is called today globalization, you see that the value of the individual has reason uh, besides or vis-a-vis -vis the value of the collective. So this is one of the features of the modern world. Another one I touched already, this is what we call globalization. And we can talk about this. Globalization, as I understand it, is mainly the expansion of the American form of capitalism to the whole world. This has a lot of beneficial aspects, but it also has a lot of problematic aspects. And one of these feature and problematic aspect is the loss of identity in many, many ways to many people around the world. Just yesterday, in one of the English-speaking newspapers in Thailand, I read the publication of a major study, a, a research study done here in Thailand about new lifestyles and what are the changes in Thai society. And so the headlines in this newspaper article was sex and the city, following this American sitcom um, which has the same title. And what was expressed there as a summary of this study was that lifestyles are changing very much also in Thailand. And basically, the people in the urban centers of Thailand, they are following, so to speak, the philosophy of this television sitcom, Sex and the City. Now, this raises, of course, the question about identity. So, if we enter into a dialogue, we can speak about Thai identity. What does it mean to be a Thai in a global world? What does it mean to have an individual, to have a cultural identity? And looking at this study, I would raise the question, do you want to become in the future like Americans or like Europeans? Do you want to change your lifestyle? Do you want to change your way of living? Or is there a way to remain Thai if you wish to keep this identity and yet be a participant in the modern world? So this is another field about which we can discuss. The third one in this part one is uh, that we speak about human rights and democracy and the system of democracy and what is called the debate of a new world order today. As you know, this is a major conflict since the preparation to this last war in Iraq, that conflicts did arise between the United States on the one side and practically the rest of the world on the other side, about how we would like to see that our world will be organized. This was the notion of the new world order. And Europeans, also China, also Soviet Union or Russia today, and, and uh, many other countries, they feel that we have to organize ourselves on a global level as a multilateral society, so that we share, that we enter into dialogue, that we make our decisions together, and that there is not one dominant factor, which is the only superpower, who then can decide in which way our future will be shaped. So this is human rights, democracy, the system of democracy. 
Then there's something else, and this is the end, the, the end of this first part. You know that the United Nations in the year 2000 proclaimed the a decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence. And within this decade, our foundation, uh, Mr. Uwe Morowitz, uh, and all our activities are embedded. So we are now in the third year of the decade, of the UN decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence. But unfortunately, as we all know, this decade did not start in a very peaceful manner. So we have another seven years to fulfill the goals of this decade, and this was a very ambitious goal because all the members of the United Nations, that means almost 200 countries, did decide on the top level, that means on the head of state or head of government level, that within 10 years, within this decade, we will make the transition from a culture of war to a culture of peace. So, I speak about a culture of peace, of non-violence and love. And now I come to a subject which I'm sure uh, that all of you are very interested in, and this is the subject of love. Usually this is not part of political science. This is unfortunately not part of any kind of science. Also it's one of the most interesting subjects, particularly for young people. So, what do I mean if I say we have to establish a culture of love? It's very simple. There are two conditions that love can happen. The first condition is that I accept fully somebody else. Of course I have to accept myself, but I accept another being. And second, I want to make this subject of my love happy. These are the two conditions. So full acceptance, we can speak about conditional love and unconditional love, but unconditional love means that if I meet somebody, then I accept you, I embrace you for what you are. I don't put any conditions, I just say you are great. I accept you, I know you have weaknesses, I know you have strengths and so on, but I accept you for who you are. And second, I want to make you happy. And if these two conditions are met, then love can appear. Before I define love, I want to briefly define coexistence. What means coexistence? Coexistence means that we live together, that we cooperate, that we interact with each other, despite the fact that we are different and despite the fact that we might have certain disagreements in particular points. So despite the fact of differences, despite the fact of possible and potential disagreements, we are working together, we are cooperating, we are living together. This is coexistence. And love means an intense state of joyful living in coexistence. I repeat it and summarize it. So we need to accept each other. We need to make each other we, we need to have the wish to make each other happy, and then we are operating in a state called love. This you can apply to your private relationships. You can test it whether these conditions are necessary and sufficient that love appears, but we can also apply it on a global scale. And therefore, we speak about the culture of peace and love because this means nothing else than that we just make a new social contract. Yeah? Each of us, with each of the other person here, we could sign a little agreement, a little paper, which we call a social contract. And in this social contract, we have just two or three lines, two or three paragraphs. The first one is that we accept each other as we are, 
Second, that we want to make each other happy. And third, uh, that we are operating in the state called love. Yeah? That means nothing else than to accept each other and make each other happy. And if we all would make such an agreement, if we would write something like a social, a new social contract, then we can achieve a peaceful world. It is so simple. The second part about what we could talk and should talk probably is understanding conflict. What are conflicts? Ladies and gentlemen, conflicts arises out of disputes. So a dispute is something which happens many, many times every day. A dispute is a disagreement between two people, between two groups of people about a certain issue. Usually what we call a disagreement uh, of this type, a dispute, you can solve very easy if we would be rational beings. Because a dispute is a pragmatic disagreement and uh, we can do some research and then usually we find an answer, who is right, who is wrong, and that's it. So this is a dispute. But since we human beings unfortunately are not rational beings alone, we are also emotional beings, Therefore, under the layer of the dispute is a deeper layer, which is an emotional layer. So, most of the disputes then get fueled by an emotional layer. And this shifts then the emphasis of the dispute from the original issue where we started in a dispute and then we suddenly enter gradually into a confrontation between two emotional personalities. And we kind of almost forget from where we started because now we start to fight on an emotional level. So this is a next layer. And under this, of course you have, a, it's like a rainbow, you have many layers, but I just point out the three major layers. So there's another deeper layer, which we call a deep-rooted conflict. And a deep-rooted conflict, and most of the deep-rooted conflicts are cross-cultural conflicts. That means now we are not only emotional, but we speak about the layer of our cultural and personal identity. So if we start to enter into this type of conflict, we deny each other's identity usually. And this creates tremendous fear, and this can create a lot of aggression, and therefore these deep-rooted conflicts, the cross-cultural conflicts, and all kinds of deep-rooted conflicts, very often erupt in violence, and in mutual annihilation, or the wish to annihilate one, uh, each other. So we have to understand the nature of conflict and the process of conflict, and then we can go to the third part, and this is managing conflict, or conflict resolution. You will find a lot of literature, probably you have within political science or other studies, you have looked already into this, but there are many, many techniques to manage conflict or to resolve conflict. Once we understand the nature of conflict and we know the techniques and the tools to resolve conflict, uh, we don't feel so helpless because then we say, well, there are many ways to handle conflicts but the main way is that we have to find the instruments to settle disputes and conflicts in a non-violent manner. And all these tools are just there for this purpose. And this is the third part about which we could talk. And uh, I would conclude now my introductory remarks because I think you also have some material which was uh, previously sent to you and uh, the rector told me it was distributed 
And so, you know, uh, um, basically, in a much more detailed manner, what I have written in this background material. And uh, so I would invite you now uh, that we start to enter into a dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Highness, for your contribution. After all, love, especially unconditional one, is what we all need regardless of our differences and even disagreement in beliefs, values, races, religions, and so on. And we need to recognize and respect one another. Without this, it's not easy to live a peaceful coexistence. And this juncture, the floor is open for questions. If you have uh, any questions, please come forward to the microphone provided in, in the aisles. And uh, please Alfred will answer the questions. Good afternoon, Your Highness. My name is Chalai. I'm a business English student here, and my question is, in what way would you like to organize our future world? Thank you. As I said, this is very, a uh, very complex and uh, difficult question which you raise, but thank you very much. Um, this is what I briefly touched as the issue of a new world order. You see, if we look at the world today, we see that conflicts are on the rise everywhere. I did speak about the, the rise of the individual, and I can say that individuality and conflict are the two sides of the same coin. So, our way to express ourselves individually and to pursue our interests meet the interests of the other individual who pursue his or her own interest. And therefore, uh, in pursuing our individual interests, it comes to a clash of interests. And this happens on the individual level as well as on the level of societies, cultures, and states. So what we can see the main feature in regard also to the prevention of conflicts is that there is no other way than to enter into this way to handle conflict which we call love. And the precondition for this is that we start to speak to each other, that we enter into a dialogue. So the resort to force the resort to violence, to settle conflict, this is the wrong way. It's a wrong way in many ways. It's economically the wrong way because we can bring many, many different examples throughout history that it's much more expensive uh, to lead a war than to prevent the conflict in ways of negotiations. So, um, the main feature of this new world order has to be that we are willing to understand each other, that we are willing to listen to each other, that we are willing to learn more about different cultures and from where we come and how we see the world. So it's the willingness to understand. It's the willingness to enter into a respectful dialogue and it means also that we need some institutions which assist us in entering into respectful dialogue and in working out a system which is in the interest of the whole of humanity and not only in the interest of a few countries or a few um, uh, nations. I indicated before that 
this form of organizing the world we call a multilateral organization. That means in, in um, applying or listening to the old saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, it is not wise to have only one dominant force in the world. And this means the unilateral view, which is currently pursued by the United States, but the multilateral view is that it's better that we join in consensus, that we form councils, that we enter into dialogue to decide in a democratic manner how we want to shape our societies. This is this is, these are the basic features uh, for such a world order, such a culture of peace and non-violence. Okay, um, so we, we, to answer that question, we have to be willing to understand each other and also respect each other. Thank you very much for this question. It's of course also one of the most difficult things. Uh, you know, this is also linked with what is called wisdom. Um, it's the nature probably of human beings um, that, that we are not necessarily born and prepared to act unconditionally. But especially since you are studying business and management, you know that the whole economy is based on condition. Yeah? You say, uh, I see that you are in need, I can provide you with what you need, but my condition is that you pay this and that price to me. Yeah? Otherwise, I block you from getting what you need. So this is the way our world basically works. So in, in, on the one side, human beings are conditional beings because we are conditioned by our culture, we are conditioned by our education, our whole behavioral patterns, all this is directed in a way that we only act if our conditions are met. But there is another side to us human beings, and this is that inside ourselves, if we take the time to look briefly in our heart, we feel that there is a desire for love. There is a desire of being accepted for who you are. There is a desire and there is a dream, maybe, uh, to live in a world full of harmony and of love. And, uh, so we human beings have both of these sides and basically what religion and what spiritual approaches, uh, what spiritual traditions are offering us, this is a way to change our personality, to clean our personality if you want in such a way that we become able to love unconditionally. But of course, it's a long way, and uh, as people say, actually, it's the longest journey you can make in your life, yeah? The longest journey you can make in your life is from here, from the rational mind, to here, to the heart full of compassion. This is the longest trip, the longest journey in your life, because it takes you the whole life. In most cases, even at the end of the life, you might have not yet arrived here from here. Now, the problem of our educational system is this, uh, that uh, we are trained only on this rational level. 
We are trained only on the intellectual level. But we don't get a training in our schools, in our universities, uh, to open the heart, to get more intuitive, to, to uh, become more sensitive to the needs and necessities of, of the others. And so, unfortunately, we are in a situation that we have to do this kind of education for ourselves. But uh, as I said, I mean, uh, we, we have all the desire to enter into such a state, to find love in this world, but then we have to also give love and we just have to work it out with ourselves, basically, that we enter more and more into something which we can call a state of unconditional love. Thank you. So we, we all need um, wisdom that can derive from religion, because religion is a way to share um, our life, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Excellent, right? Things and things. May I have a early chat question? What is the best way of the conflict resolution strategy of winning and losing today? Well, there are basic strategies for conflict resolution. And uh, we, we have basically, this comes from game theory, operational research, game theory. Uh, so we have three strategies. The most common strategy of conflict, of handling a conflict, is what is called win-lose strategy. That means this is mathematically expressed a zero-sum game. Yeah, that means Either I win and then you lose, or you win and I lose. So sports, for instance, soccer games and all these are win-lose strategies. One winner and the winner wins on the cost of the loser. We have another strategy, which you can call lose-lose strategy. This is usually happening in the conflict resolution and managing conflict when, when a third party steps into a conflict. A third party with authority, either with moral authority or with political or military power. In other words, in many conflicts today, we see, let's say, President Clinton invites the Israeli side and the Palestinian side to Camp David, and he says, now we will sit the three of us, the leaders of these three uh, countries or uh, communities, we sit together, but I make clear from the beginning, because I'm the President of the United States, that within four days we come to a solution. And I will sit as long as the two of you conflicting parties and press you. I give you incentives, economic uh, aid, for instance. But also, I will threaten you that if you don't come to a solution, then you will face certain consequences. This is a loose, or let's say, uh, because we are here in a university. So if two uh, students are. Uh, in a conflict, uh, then uh, the teacher or professor or the rector um, uh, might call the two students in the office and say, hey, I mean, I want now that you settle your dispute right now here. Yeah? So this is lose-lose usually because both conflicting parties not necessarily want to settle or are prepared to settle the conflict. Therefore, a third power force system or seduces them, but in most cases forces them, and then both parties are losing, in their perspective, something when the, 
when they resolve the conflict. And then we have a third strategy, and this is win-win. And this means uh, that, again, in a mathematical game theory, we can prove that in many, many cases of conflict, we, uh, we can find a solution where both parties of the conflict are better off after the resolution than they have been before. And so both gained something, both gained what they were most interested. And this is called a win-win strategy. So these are the three basic strategies. And uh, it becomes clear uh, from what I said that the main strategy should be win-win. This is something which achieves a lasting resolution of a, of a conflict. And from there, probably peace may appear. Thank you very much. Okay. So there are three basic strategies to resolve uh, conflicts. The first one is win-lose. Uh, for this one, either you win or I lose, either way. And the second one is lose-lose. Uh, no one wins, basically. And the last one is win-win, which is the best strategy, because um, everyone has uh, a better deals so they can negotiate effectively. Um, because of time consuming, we will take one more question. Well, you see, I, I, I cannot give you a recipe, unfortunately. You, you have to take up the responsibility to work out a way how to build on the strengths of Thai tradition, of Thai history, of Thai society, and uh, based on these strengths, of the Thai culture, you have to assess uh, how in the best way this traditional Thai culture can contribute in building a new world order. So, of course, it's very, very difficult in the world today because, as I said, the attraction of the Western way of life, let's call it like this, is very strong. And I am not critical necessarily to this Western way of life, of course, because I'm coming from there, I'm part of it. But, you know, I have to make this maybe a little bit longer because I want to speak briefly in this context about human rights and the system of democracy first. You know, what are human rights? Human rights is nothing else than that we guarantee the minimum to human individuals so that they can live as human beings. If the this minimum is not guaranteed. That means human rights say that everybody is entitled for shelter, for food, for health service, for education, for water, sanitation, and to live in a certain dignity. And that these are the basic rights which we call human rights. Now, if you don't guarantee this to human beings, then you practically force them to live like animals. They cannot live in, 
dignity as human beings. So this is the human rights. This is the minimum guarantee to the individual to live as human being. The democracy, the system of democracy, is nothing else, in my view, than a mechanism to resolve conflicts. But therefore, it's so both of these concepts, yeah? Human rights on the one side and the system of democracy is very much linked with the Western philosophy, the Western way of living, because we in the West consider conflict actually as something positive. So we speak about conflict resolution, but it does not mean that conflict is something negative. For us in the Western world, disagreements or a clash of interest is something absolutely natural. This is the way business is conducted. This is the way of human rights on the one side and the system of democracy is very much linked with the Western philosophy, the Western way of living, because we in the West consider conflict actually as something positive. So we speak about conflict resolution, but it does not mean that conflict is something negative. For us in the Western world, disagreements or a clash of interest is something absolutely natural. This is the way business is conducted, this is the way our personal life uh, is led. Uh, that means I express freely and frankly my interests. I say I have this and that goals in life, I am pursuing this and that interests, and this I tell you now, and then you will tell me, okay, but I have these interests and that interests, and my goals are like this, and then we find out uh, and that these goals, that these interests are either in competition or that they are not compatible. Yeah? So, therefore, because this is the way we act in the Western world, that we are individual-centered, and at the same time, through this individuality, we enter into a clash of interests and therefore we had to develop a system which resolved these conflicts and this is the system of democracy. So, in other words, democracy is an arbitration system and it's based on the rules that everybody, each party, political party, but each individual party has his or her own interests in pursuing the interests and not the public interest. And this is now when we speak about business, for instance, and public-private partnership and so on, then we see again these basic conflicts because business is profit-oriented. Business pursues the private interest, the partial interests, while politics should pursue the public interest and should be there for the common good. And so private and public interest usually is also entering in a conflict. And all these conflicts are normal in our societies. And again, democracy is a way to resolve these conflicts. Now, if I look to Asia, then we have a complete different situation. Because basically, some more, some less, but basically, Asian societies are conflict avoidance societies. So conflict in traditional Asian societies is regarded as something very negative. And everything what you in Asia are doing in everyday life permanently is to signalize to each other, I don't want to have conflict, therefore you act like you smile, you bow, and you say, hey, I don't want any conflict with you. I show you that my hands are no weapons, no conflict, please, you know? So, now, of course, for a culture which is based on conflict avoidance, conflict resolution might look very different than in a culture where conflict is the daily bread. So, democracy 
is for sure and human rights has a universal value. But the forms of the democracy which will be developed and will work out or crystallize uh, in the different cultures might look very different. So we can have basic features, but the institutions or the mechanisms might be very different. So again, we are at this point where I said either you become a Western culture, then, and this is, it looks right now that most of you young people, you are interested in video clips of this and that artist, you, you see how uh, you know Eminem and uh, I don't know who uh, they are expressing themselves, you know, and this is uh, an extreme of individualism. And so many of the young people around the world say, hey, I want also to have this. I want to pursue my career. I want to express myself culturally and personally. And even I compete with others of my uh, uh, age group and so on, because I want to be the best and I want to be uh, the most accepted and the most loved and so on. So one way for Asian cultures is that you adopt more and more Western values and Western way of life, and then probably also the democracy which you will have ultimately in your culture might look very Western, or maybe you find another way, but I cannot give you a recipe. I just can point out these basic uh, uh, features, but you as a society, as a culture, as a community, you have to work this out. You have to make up your mind and say, hey, what is my identity? What, how do I see the future of the world? How do I want to see a society here in Thailand developing uh, for my children and grandchildren? What should be the basic features? Shall it be capitalistic like the American capitalistic system? Shall it be a humanistic system? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, it's endless, but I just point you out a few points, yeah? So capitalistic system, says, for instance, that in the center of the system is the capital, yeah? And we humans have to serve the capital interest. This is capitalism. If you have a, a, a technocratic system, yeah? Then in the center is maybe science and technology, yeah? But then we humans basically have to serve uh, uh, science and technology. I'm personally in favor of a humanistic system. I want that the human being is in the center of society and that economy, that technology and so on is serving human beings to fulfill themselves and to make the best out of their human potential. So these are basic features um, and, and thoughts uh, to your answer and uh, I wish you that you continue to think and discuss this with your colleagues uh, and that you make up your mind and define your own individual way as a culture and as a human being. Okay, um, sorry about the time and uh, I was told that we, we can explain our time more. So if you have more questions, Please come forward to the microphone. Good afternoon, Your Highness. My name is Pichai. I am a business English student here. My question is referring to the definition of peaceful coexistence, that this means that there needs to be a blurring of cultural identities. Sorry, uh, the, this last part I did phonetically not understand. There's a blurring of identities? Blurring. Blurring? blurring. Th that means? Yeah, it's not clear. Okay, okay. Well, this is not my understanding, because I define again what I said is coexistence. Coexistence is that we live together, work together, 
interact with each other, cooperate, despite the fact that we are different, and despite the fact that we might disagree in certain goals, in certain uh, values, and so on. So I cannot see what you ask me, that this is a blurring of identities. In contrary, I keep my identity, you keep your identity, I see that you are um, a Thai, I'm a, a European, uh, uh, you have a certain age, I have a certain age, etc., etc. But that does not mean that we cannot work together harmoniously, that we cannot cooperate, that we cannot be friends, that we don't want to make each other happy, and so on. So in contrary, coexistence is a way to respect the differences and the potential disagreements between us. So I respect fully that you are different, but yet I say this does not mean that I have to beat you and you have to beat me. You understand? Because I don't want that you are the same as me, and you hopefully don't want that I be the same as you, you understand? So respect and respectful dialogue, cooperation, interaction, this is the basis of coexistence. So you keep your identities, you preserve your identities, you you develop your potential in your own way and we do it together. So it's a form of co-evolution, you know? We help each other to evolve, to become more mature. We inspire each other in our difference. Because if we would be all the same, it would be not very inspirational, you know? Uh, so out of this coexistence, co-evolution, uh, and the handling of differences and disagreements in this way, something new will appear, a synthesis of our positions, a synthesis of our cooperation. You know, we create something new. And this is, maybe to finish this remark, you see, this is the fascinating part of love. Now I speak more about the, the romantic aspect of love. Because love is doing something which is very strange. It takes away our identity on one level. You know, if you are really in love, you lose yourself, they say, yeah? You get crazy, yeah? You, you don't know who you are anymore because you are obsessed with this other being, yeah? You, you, you are doing like this, I'm sure you have experienced it already. <laughs> Otherwise, you would not agree so much. So, you, you lose yourself, you know? So, now love takes away our identity. But at the same time, it makes us feel great. It makes us feel unique. It brings us a lot of joy, yeah? So, Suddenly we understand that this is an interesting model because on, on the one level, love, if we enter into this state, it takes away our old identity. But on a higher level, it gives us a new identity and this is the identity of the two loving beings together. So, the mathematics of love is that out of oneness, singleness, you take away the identity of the singleness and you become two, in a two-ness, which is a oneness, yeah, it sounds a little stupid maybe what I say, but I think you get, uh, you, you get it, you understand, so suddenly two are becoming one and they create together a new identity. And therefore, I say it's a very interesting model on many levels, this model of love. Because if we, as I said earlier, if we enter into a culture of love, then we understand that we, all human beings, we might lose our identity in the process of this globalization. But if we handle it the right way, we will receive another identity as a human family on a higher level, and this human family is united in love. And this would be the model.
very much. Uh, in, in our society, we have a tight saying about our love. If one fall in love, you know, that person can be a blind. So love makes one a blind because the person upset with, with the one whom he or she loves. At least it makes us blind for a short time, maybe not forever. But okay. <laughs> okay. Um, any other question? Okay, we have uh, one question. Good afternoon, Your Highness. My name is Kanyala. I'm a sophomore studying business English. My question is, how should we react to people who are prejudicial to us? Thank you very much. Who are prejudiced? Yes. OK. You see, basically, Again, if you, so to speak, enter into a conflicting situation, there are three major ways to respond. The first one is aggressiveness. Yeah? If you enter into such a situation and somebody um, is prejudiced to you and makes fun about you um, and uh, denies you respect and so on, um, then of course, but this is more just in brackets, it's the cowboy way, yeah? You take out your gun and you shoot, yeah? Say, go out of my way, yeah? So the one way to react is aggressiveness. Of course, I'm not promoting this. Another way is, I don't know now the right English word, but that you duck it out, yeah? That you kind of, Ignore it. Then you say, well, um, uh, I cannot handle this situation, so I just don't react and I act as if this would not happen. Yeah, many people are doing this in conflicting situations that they say, well, I, I just go away or I duck it out, I feel I, I should not, uh, I don't want to enter into a conflict. The third way is that you address it and that you negotiate it, that you enter into a dialogue, yeah? that you find, and this is what we can call diplomacy. You know? This is what our uh, ambassador is doing his whole life. Yeah? It's the, the diplomatic way. So you have to find a way to to address the issue, yeah? So that you say, that you find out why the person is acting in this way to you and make this person understand that you don't feel comfortable with this, that you don't think that this is justified, that you feel it's not fair. Uh, and out of such a dialogue, um, which hopefully occurs in such a situation, but this is something we have to learn. Yeah, this third way, the word, way of diplomacy, the way of resolving and settling disputes or lat latent conflicts, this is something we should learn in school and in universities uh, because it's not something which we, most of us, cannot do without a certain training. But these are the three basic ways to react to conflict. <laughs> Any other question? Good afternoon, Prince Alfred. I am Sri Moon from Business English major. I have a question. Have a set of objective criteria that can be used to evaluate a nation's action being identified? If so, is it being used now? Thank you. Wait again. Sorry. Can you can you repeat it? It's it's a little echo here, so I can. 
so the first part was evaluation. Yeah. Evaluation of what? Yes. Uh, um, I have an action. Evaluation? Yeah, maybe you just... Evaluate. A nation actions. A nation's actions. Yes, yes. Okay, to evaluate a nation's action yes. in regard to what? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Again. Please. Had a set of object, objective criteria that can be used to evaluate a nation's actions being identified. If so, is it being used now? Okay. It's <laughs> I, I, sorry, I'm very slow. English is not my language, and it's also afternoon. I would like to sleep already. <laughs> so, but um, so a criteria uh, to evaluate nations' actions. But uh, in some ways, you did not let me know in which regard. Uh, so. Um, There are two parts of the question. The, the first part is something about a set of objective criteria. To evaluate nations' actions, yeah? But in general, I mean, to evaluate what kind of action of nation this I did not get. Uh, what? For foreign policy, domestic policy. Um, and anyway, uh, you would like to answer. To deliver the answer <laughs> because this is a very broad question. Uh, you, so. I, I see you have discovered already that I like to talk, so it doesn't yeah, matter uh, what you ask me. Yeah, anyway, just to talk. Just aim okay. at us. <laughs> your, your Highness, with your no. permission, may I help my student? Okay. Uh, this is cooperation. I, I, yes. I think that uh, she, uh, what she's trying to say is try to ask you is that uh, suppose you want to uh, want, want to say this nation's action is good or this nation's action is bad what is the criteria to use to judge for example if the American new American policy uh, is to go on staying in uh, Iraq you know uh, how how can we judge whether It is, it, it is good or is it bad? So what the criteria is? Yes. You know, thank you very much. It's a very good question. I, I just was slow, sorry. Um, this is the issue which became so famous now in the international discourse after or during the American uh, presidential campaign and after the campaign when the world, to a certain degree, was astonished that President Bush was re-elected with such a majority. Yeah? And then the analysis started within the United States and outside the United States, how does it come that he was re-elected so strongly? And then they say it's moral values. So I at least get what the question is. I mean, the criteria of moral values and ethic values But, you know, there are two ways to answer to this. Of course, we could be very philosophical, but I want to be more practical here. So, one way to look at actions of states is the following, also of, of individuals, by the way. Many think that the goal justifies the means. Now I get a little cynical, but if, and I think we all agree with what President Bush said in its inaugural speech, he did say to the world, we will bring now freedom and democracy to the world. We want to end tyranny. We want that the people are living in free societies that they can Uh, pursue their own interests, and so on and so on. So, when I heard this speech of President Bush, I said to my wife, I can underline 
and support each word of this speech of President Bush. So then I have to ask myself, but yet why I'm not happy? Yes, I'm not happy with this policy because the vision, the goal is right, but the way to achieve it is not the way I would like to see it. So in other words, since you mentioned Iraq, I, I ask you back the question, yeah? If you intervene in a country under false pretext, in other words, you lie to your people and say we have to go and uh, intervene militarily in this country because of weapons of mass destruction. Then we find out that this was a false pretext. Then we change the argument and we say, well, actually we did go in not because of this purpose, but we did go in uh, because we want to have a regime change there. So, okay, we want to remove a bad dictator. Now then, we want to bring democracy there, yeah? But on the way of bringing freedom and democracy, we have to make a little war, yeah? And in this little war, we kill uncounted Iraqi civilians. Civilians which should be still alive today. They just wanted to have peace, and I'm not speaking about the so-called insurgents. I'm speaking about what is called collateral damage. Yeah? the casualties of war. And the American government and the Pentagon has even stopped long time ago to count this Iraqi uh, dead Iraqi people, the, the, the Iraqi victims, yeah? because they are of no interest on our way to freedom and democracy. So I think this is not the right way. So in other words, one criteria to look at actions of individuals or states is that we have to observe also the way how the goals are uh, achieved. And um, for me and many people it's quite clear that through war, you can gain victory, but you can never gain peace. This is very important. I said it the other day where I uh, gave a lecture in the National Defense College, and, and uh, so uh, we discussed this, yeah, that with the means of war, with the means of violence, you cannot achieve peace, only victory. You can gain victory, yeah? So, I think what in, in, in the Christian book, in the Bible, is uh, uh, also mentioned, it's uh, on your fruits, on the fruits of their deeds, you will recognize them. That means, uh, you, if you want to achieve peace, you have to do it with peaceful means. You have to do it with appropriate means. Yeah? You can achieve peace only by being peaceful. You cannot achieve peace in a different way. And again, I'm, I, uh, to finish this uh, subject, I, if I'm very cynical, I don't say that this is the American foreign policy, but I just uh, say in a cynical manner, in general, in an abstract way, I could say a good way to achieve peace in the world is that we bomb everybody and everything until we are all dead, and then there's peace. Do you understand the point? It's not the right way. Yeah? We have to look for different means. And this is much more complicated, and uh, this is dialogue, this is negotiation, and this is mutual understanding, and this is love. This means we want to make each other happy. We will accept each other. We never stop to speak to each other. We continue to hope. Because in this world today, full of conflicts, and there will be more and more conflicts, unfortunately, as it looks now, if we don't put a stop on this, if we don't change from a culture of war to a culture of peace and to peaceful attitude, then we will enter into tremendous conflicts in the next decades. And the only way out is uh, 
this way of love and mutual understanding, respectful dialogue, uh, and uh, speaking to each other, listening to each other, understanding each other. To live with hope and peace is what we need, actually. Uh, is there any other question? In Oxford or Cambridge, it is very bad manners to refer to the rival university by name. One just says the other place. So I hope I cause no offense if I refer to Grand Kang Hen University where you raised some interesting points yesterday. You regretted that there was no system better than the democracy. And English golf clubs have evolved a system which is better. They still have their committees of people who like to sit around and talk about things but they appoint a small management committee actually to run the club. Usually a chartered accountant, a lawyer, a horticulturalist, and a caterer with those sort of expertise. And the result is vastly improved management. Could it be said that the running of a country is too difficult and too important to be carried out by politicians? A second part of my question referring to yesterday is that you informed us of the new constitution in Liechtenstein and that any part of the country could declare itself independent. Many of the conflicts in the world are to do with the wish of a group to declare their independence. Could there be a United Nations formula for that with possibly a probationary period during which conflict could be resolved, and a definition of the level of independence, which might not include all aspects of government. Well, thank you very much. I start with the second part. I mentioned yesterday uh, that since last year, Liechtenstein has a new constitution, and part of this new constitution is the right, the full right of self-determination even down to the level of the communes. So theoretically also, uh, as the, uh, His Excellency said in the beginning, Liechtenstein is a tiny, tiny little country, but yet we have a number of communes in this country. So to exemplify a new type of, in, of constitution, my cousin, the ruling prince, insisted very much to put into this new constitution the right of self-determination for each commune. So theoretically, in Liechtenstein, since last year, each commune can declare in a certain process based on the constitution its independence and can choose to create a new little state on its own, a baby, baby state, or to join another state, theoretically. So far, none of the Liechtenstein communes have done uh, this yet. Now, in regard to also what His Excellency said in the beginning, uh, in regard to the new world order, uh, Europe is currently probably the most exciting experiment on a large scale which is going on. Because what we have here is an geographical integration, an integration of markets, and it's a fast-growing market. As you know now, there's the debate about Ukraine and maybe Turkey. So if these two countries would come in, uh, uh, then we have another 150 million or so more population, so the markets would expand tremendously. But at the same time, we have many, many different languages. We have about 30 languages uh, in uh, in Europe right now. And of course, within the European community, there is a heavy debate about the constitution of this European community and in which way we organize ourselves. Whether we are decentralized, whether we follow the Swiss model, for instance, or whether we are more centralized and follow another model. So, but what we 
what we have to find a way in the European communities to preserve diversity because we have so many different cultures and different languages in, in, in Europe. So we try to find a way, a balance between uh, centralization and decentralization, unity and the preservation of diversity. Now, self-determination is a key to this, but the response of of it, of this question in Europe is the principle of subsidiarity. That means we have put in the draft of the Constitution of Europe now this principle of su subsidiarity, which means that every administrative and political decision should be done on the lowest possible level of responsibility. That means on the most local level to cover this issue. So the central government, so to speak, the headquarters, they should not be involved in affairs which are of such type that they can be handled on the local, on the decentralized level. This is the response to the question of preserving the diversity and yet being efficient. And in certain also mathematical models and so on, we can show that this is also the most cost-effective and the most efficient way. Because usually if you have a centralized government how can they know in the center in the headquarters so to speak what are the real needs and the necessities on the local level the people on the local level they know best how to organize this and how to handle it so this this is one part uh, to answer your question of course what you touched can be stretched very much because if you look carefully at this right of self-determination then you can say this right of self-determination is so crucial and compelling to many in the world and that they feel the means to achieve self-determination justifies the use of violence and this is what we call freedom fighters or what we call terrorism because most of the movements which some of us call terrorists if you would ask them whether they are terrorists they will tell you no we are just fighting for our freedom we want our right of self-determination respected so this is a the right of self-determination is a very explosive issue and therefore actually but I don't want to go in details uh, also Liechtenstein did start uh, but a number of years ago an initiative within the United Nations to debate the right of self-determination and this is the background to the change of the constitution because Liechtenstein wanted to show that you can put this in a constitution and actually Liechtenstein wants to be as a model here that the right of self, of peaceful self-determination should be put in every constitution around the world. But of course, as you will understand, many of the big countries, they say we have no interest to put this in the constitution because we are afraid uh, that if we do this in Spain, if we do this in France, for instance, then the Basques will go away. If we do it in Turkey, then the Kurds will go away. If we do it in Iran, the Kurds will go away, and maybe the Shiites will go to Persia, and so on and so on. So, because of fear that the status quo in the world will be destroyed, the right of self-determination is mainly denied to the people who would strive for self-determination. And now these people, in many cases, don't find any other way anymore than to raise their arms. And they say, well, then we will fight for this right of self-determination. And now they become freedom fighters, 
or in the eyes of the others or some others, then they say, hey, they are destroying the integrity of our uh, territory, of our nation, and so on, and therefore we call them, we label them terrorists, and we will fight a bloody fight against them now, um, and this is a fight, a conflict of mutual annihilation. But as I pointed out before, that through war, through the, through the use of force, you can gain victory, you can kill each other, but you will not achieve peace. So, the lawful use of force, the right of self-defense, the right of self-determination, and terrorism is very close connected as subject. And uh, this is also really the main debate which is going on in the world now. To your first question, well, this is actually more or less the model of representative de democracy. Because what is representative democracy? It is like your golf club. We say, you know, we are a country, a nation, we are a society, a state, and we have so and so many people in population, but we cannot have a full self-rule. That means we need to appoint certain representatives which we elect, and these representatives elect again an executive body, and this is then the executive committee, and whether this is a golf club or whether you call it government, it's basically the same. And there are some countries uh, where the, uh, um, the, the head of the government uh, also looks at the, at the country like a company and says, I'm just the CEO of this company called so and so, uh, and my ministers, uh, uh, they are uh, the board members, and therefore I run the country as if it would be a company. So this is the system of representative democracy. But there are two countries in the world which have a different system currently, and this is Switzerland and Liechtenstein. And you might be astonished that Liechtenstein has uh, so many uh, features in all this tininess, but it's really interesting because you can experiment in such a small country. Yeah? But so Switzerland and Liechtenstein, these are not representative democracies, but direct democracies. That means in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, all major decisions are done directly by the population in forms of referendum. And so, during the course of a year, in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, there are a number of days where referendums are taking place, and then all the major foreign policy, economic policy, and other policy issues are put in front of the people, and the people directly decide we are in favor of this initiative or we are against this initiative. And this is the final word. So this is another model which is called direct democracy. Of course, you have also a kind of executive committee, which is the government and so on. But in Switzerland, for instance, it's a model where all parties are permanently represented in the government, which is also very interesting. So of course, sometimes with uh, more or less ministers uh, or secretaries, but uh, they are always there because it's a different approach. It's not so much the majority rule, but the basic principle of uh, the Swiss and uh, idea is that we want to achieve consensus. Yeah? So, People elect different parties, but then all these parties in different uh, uh, proportions are represented in the government. And also, for instance, in Switzerland, you don't have a permanent president, um, but it's a rotating, uh, the, in this government, you have a speaker of the government, and this person is rotating. That means each year or second year, uh, another speaker of this executive committee is called President of Switzerland. Okay, uh, 
Uh, we still have more time. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate. I see this. Okay, one, one more. This? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this will be the last question. Good afternoon, Your Highness. My name is Mano. I'm studying business in English. My question is, recently many conflicts are caused by people who use their power in the way. How can we solve this kind of problem? Thank you. You know, the, the flaw of conflict resolution is that you can only settle a dispute or a conflict basically if both conflicting parties are willing to settle the conflict and are willing to settle it more or less peaceful. So if, if one or both of the two conflicting parties are not willing to resolve the conflict, it's very difficult to, to manage it. Then basically it's only possible through what we call the third party peacemaker in a role of a peacemaker. I mentioned this before that a third party which is a moral authority or an, has a power, political military power comes in and says hey enough is enough. Now I want that you sit together and I will force you to make peace. So this is unfortunately the nature of conflict and conflict resolution is such that you only can resolve a conflict if both parties are willing to do it. But of course there are very different ways to do it. So if only the two parties are involved then you call it negotiations. Yeah? If the two conflicting parties are trying to resolve the conflict this is a negotiation. Then you have other ways where third parties get involved in the resolution of conflict. And this, and I will not go into details now, but you call it in dependence of the level of involvement of the third party, you call it moderation, facilitation, mediation, or arbitration. And an arbitra is nothing else than a judge. Because what, is, what our courts are doing is conflict resolution two conflicting parties who are suing each other yeah, because they cannot settle the conflict so therefore they go to the lawyers, they sue each other, they go to a court and then an arbitra called judge comes in and this arbitra uh, then has the authority and uh, uh, that he can decide ultimately on this conflict. Yeah? He makes a resolution of the conflict by his power and because the two conflicting parties in advance say we will accept the decision of this arbiter. But of course you can have arbitration also outside the court through an arbiter which is called in by the two conflicting parties. But then there's another way which is called peacemaker and this is what I said and uh, before and then uh, the last Possibility is what we call peacekeeping, peacekeeper. This is usually what the United Nations are doing, but this is a post-resolution situation. Either after a ceasefire is achieved between two conflicting parties, or a resolution has been achieved, and then the peacemaker just comes in to keep the conflicting parties separate so that new, not a new violent conflict can arise. But as I said, all this mainly basically works when, uh, when the conflicting parties are interested to settle their dispute and conflict. And therefore, let's say there are no, not many other means if, if one side uh, is insisting in the use of force, then you can only resort to the uh, issue of self-defense or, or or you can start to pray. It's, you can try to convince. There's no other way. I'm sorry. 
Okay, right. Thank you very much, Your Highness, for your contribution. We have come to the end of the event, and I'd like to take this opportunity to call upon our distinguished president, uh, Dr. Narong Sinsua, to present a token of appreciation to the keynote speaker, and followed by the closing address. Thank you very much, Your Highness. I think all of us here, all the students, faculty members, and our guests, learn a lot. Learn the culture of peace. Liechtenstein, we, we always think that uh, it's a small country by size and by population. But as you have witnessed today, the idea is not small. The idea is much bigger than many large nations. Example is Switzerland. Switzerland, which the citizen of Switzerland is the father of the Red Cross, which help to elevate, to help uh, help the soldiers who suffer in the wars waged by a much larger nations. So we have learned a lot. With the permission of Your Highness, I would like to summary, put a summary of what you have said in Thai language. Còn nè, ông kia bảo nước xã cũng không thể liền lưu nhớ nè, các bạn. Có, ông có khỏi lưu nhớ. Bằng thân, chuồng nhà có không chắc khảo trái thì là các ông đây xuống đây. ตราบทั้งหมดเราฟังนะครับแต่ผมขอเน้นประเด็นสำคัญสำคัญนะคือประเทศเนี่ยมันก็มีคอนฟ lict นะความรักอย่างนี้เงื่อนไขและการอยู่ร่วมกันการอยู่ร่วมกันนะก็คือหมายความว่ามันเรามีความแตกต่างอาจจะแตกต่างในเชื้อชาติในศาสนาในวั
เหมือนเหมือนกันเราไปประเทศไหนก็ตามเราก็เห็นร้านแมคโดนัลล์นะเราเห็นคนใส่เกงยีนนะดังนั้นท่านท่านท่านจะทรงตรัสว่านี่ให้เตือนว่าทุกทุกชาติควรรักษาเอกลักษณ์ของตัวถึงแม้ที่มีบางอย่างเนี่ยมันเป็นโลกาภิวัตน์เหมือนเหมือนกันหมดแต่แต่ละชาติควรจะรักรักรู้ว่าเอกลักษณ์ของตัวเราเองคืออะไรเพราะลักษณะของคนไทยอะไรคือเอกลักษณ์ของเราเราจะต้องรักษาไว้นะทุกชาติก็เป็นรักษาไว้แต่ในขณะที่มีเอกลักษณ์ที่เหมือนกันนั้นเนี่ยเมื่อเรายอมอยู่ร่วมกัน coexistence นะก็คืออยู่ร่วมกันแล้วก็มีความต้องการที่จะให้ผู้อื่นก็มีความสุขนะเราก็จะอยู่ในโลกที่มีสันติสุขนะครับดังนั้นความคิดเนี่ยมันเป็นลักษณะมันเป็นเชิงปรัชญาที่ลึกซึ้งนะแล้วก็มีประโยชน์กับมนุษยชาติ uh, lastly I would like to uh, thank uh, Your Highness we all expect to see handsome prince and charming princess uh, more than our expectation today the prince Alfred very handsome Prince Rafaela very charming and uh, we enjoy everything that uh, you offer us today and also for Uwe Morovic thank you very much that you made today the event that happened and also to uh, my own friend Dr. Songkhet Arya Prashia who uh, Traveling a long way from the other side of Bangkok uh, to here to to be with us today. Thanks also to our staff who arrange on this for everyone uh, that uh, you make this event that we can uh, long time, long time uh, take into the the memory of the history of our university. Thank you very much. On behalf of Southeast Asian University, we thank you for your time and hope to see you again at the very next series event on science and its relevance to international cooperation and a peaceful society delivered by a Nobel royalty keynote speaker from the U.S., Professor Barros S. Bluebird. The event takes place on Wednesday, March 23rd, here at the same venue and at the same time. Once again, thank you very much. Abuja.